Well, please fasten this for me, please. They make them so tiny. Mm -hmm. Michelle, mm -hmm. do a special favor for me tonight. Only name it and it's done. It is very special. And there are limits to what I will do for you? Yes. Many. But they're all political, thank goodness. <laughs> Just do not wear the handkerchief tonight. <laughs> but that's a political matter. You are more than a leader of labor now, my darling. From tonight on, you represent all the people. You cannot show partiality. Renee, you are innocent. Who elected me to the Legislative Council? The workers. Therefore, whom do I represent? The workers. And the hawk is their symbol. And who has stolen the symbol to exploit your influence with the workers? The terrorists will stop at nothing, either to win you over or to crucify you. My brother invite me to come in? They won't admit me by the proper door. Come in. I apologize to the not quite African wife of the new council member. Candler. Who also is not quite so African as he likes to think. You come here to be thrown out of my house. I've been thrown out of the white man's school. If this is a white man's house, I expect to be thrown out. Kanda, work with your brother, not against him. Let him work with us. Tonight you go to the white man's government house because you've accepted a white man's job. What are you? An Uncle Tom? He was elected by Africans. He was elected by a handful of Africans who qualify for the vote because they're property owners. You think you represent the people? Well, we're the people and we didn't elect you. If you want to stand with Africa, stand with us. Listen. We're meeting again tonight, and I've been asked to bring them your answer. Will you stand with us? Will you fight with Get us? Get out of my house. Still no answer, my brother. My friends are growing impatient. Don't delay too long. There's very little time. Get out of my house, boy. Very little time. You will not reach him with anger. Don't tell me I shall reach him with love. Some nights I wake from a bad dream. You're alone. They've all deserted you. And I remember again the words of the proverb. You are walking alone as a stranger. Where then are your brothers? My eyes are wet. And I know I have been crying in my sleep. For it seems that you have turned even from me. I will never turn from you, Renee. And in my anger and in my impatience, do not turn from me. You must go. The governor is always prompt. Renee, 
I think that uh, this embroidery is a little frivolous for a new council member. No. Yes. Madame. Governor's house. Yes, sir. something to do with the shape of my neck. <laughs> do you remember Subi? Mm, indeed I do. That was, oh gosh, that must have been 20 years ago. Uh, Shanghai. She was embarrassed all one evening because your tie went straight up and down. <laughs> you were younger then. Went mm. in for both ties. <laughs> but you never mm. could dye them. Ah, thank you. You must have a jacket of your own made right away. Not keep putting it off. Yep. Neither a borrower nor a lender be. Uh-oh. <laughs> Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> I suppose you didn't bother to try it on. Matter of fact, I didn't. Inspector looked to be about my size. <laughs> well, you'll have to wear your white suit. You know, some of the fellows around here wear nothing but pajamas. I've seen them. I can think of no better way for the newest member of the colony to endear himself than to appear at the governor's reception in pajamas. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? Remember the pair I was wearing the night they arrested us? It's kind of fond of that color. Chartreuse, I think. Aqua. Did you lock the back door? No, oh, Bengal will attend to it. Aqua? Oh, I thought. Anyway, the Chinese guards were extremely envious. Bruce, I hope you'll make it a point to speak to Obam tonight. Matthew seems to be quite worried about him. Well, Matthew will be there, too. He'll see that we meet. Well, do I pass? Bruce, do me a favor. Promise me you won't say anything drastic tonight. I shall be good. <laughs> if you don't have a dinner jacket, at least wear your best company manners. They'll learn soon enough they've got a rebel on their hands. Well, we might just make it to Benga. The fair schedule at 8.25 for 8.30 means the governor will be there in the half hour at the second. Well, just some celebration, most likely. Good evening. Evening, Benga. Good evening. Please be sure everything's locked, eh? You know, go to call? Oh, the ma. That's a Craig. MSA Kando. Kashi boy, Benga. Kashi for Mrs. Craig. Sorry, darling. Egbe, fa be a goli, Eba. What does it mean, Abenga? Oba, the hawk. It is not right. Well, never mind. Get rid of it and say nothing about it, hmm? What does it mean, Bruce? I'll find out tonight, if anyone knows. Something that a banger said. That's it. The name Obam, that's the African word for hawk. Mm. So it is. You knew it all along. Now, let's forget about it, hmm? Obam, that's why Matthew's so worried about him. Now, we're in no position to make judgments, Barbara. We're newcomers here, remember that? That sounds strange coming from you. Well, I do feel a bit strange in my company manners. May I take them off? I never really expected you to put them on. Thank you, Benger. Night. Night, sir.
After all, they were here first. You can't blame them entirely. It's the only home they've ever known. And that's all well and good. But look how they lived before we came here. Wait till we've been here longer. The whole trouble is they don't appreciate what's been done for them. Not of nerve is being here. One of these days, he'll turn his savages loose and slit our throats. Right on the second. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you, and especially our honored guests, the newest members of our Legislative Council. Please. Too conservative, my taste. There. Ah, good evening, Mr. Gregory. Good evening. I see Gregory. That must be the new American missionary over there. What's his name? Craig. Oh, yes, that's Craig, all right. Pity he didn't have sense enough to stay home. We've got enough do gooders in this colony. Uh -huh. uh, if Craig and his kind hadn't taught these Africans how to read and put ideas in their heads, we wouldn't be having this trouble. Oh, come on, Gregory. People get ideas one way or another. What do you say, Inspector? I beg your pardon, Tom. What do I say about what? Gregory here thinks it's dangerous to educate the Africans. Much more dangerous not to. But then we don't see eye to eye about several matters. <laughs> now, someday you fellows will wake up to the fact. The most dangerous ideas these Africans have, they got from the church. Equality of men before God. Brotherhood of races. Rubbish. The church doesn't believe them itself. From a man's point of view. Now, look what happened to Orban. He was the pride and joy of the church. And then he got too vocal about some of their, their pet ideas. And what happened? They kicked him out. Excuse me. I don't think he was impressed, Gregory. It's just that being new to the colony, Your Excellency, I'm apt to be considered an ignoramus. Mr. Craig, human speech can encircle the earth in a few seconds. Yet no one can determine the truth of a political situation only a few hundred yards away. You may speak freely. Well, what I was trying to say is that my church has taught the African Christians to hope for social justice, while my white Western world has kept it from them. I see. Of course, it's a much simpler matter to preach progress than to implement it. As a clergyman, you hardly need to be reminded of that. Touche. I take it you expect the church to stand on the side of African independence, come what may. Short of revolution? Well, I certainly wouldn't advocate violence. But in its beginnings, Your Excellency, the church was nothing if not revolutionary. The fact that today it's considered in some quarters as a defender of the status quo is unfortunate. I shall leave it to the inspector to give you assurance that my government at least has not endeavored to use the church. This has been most interesting, Mr. Craig, and welcome to Africa. Thank you, Your Excellency. I believe you've left the governor guessing. Do him good. What about a coffee? Oh, thank you. What was wrong with the dinner jacket? Oh, I think I could have got into it ten years ago. Thank you for the try, anyway. I'm sorry it didn't fit. Inspector, the governor said something about revolution. Things that serious? Well, put it this way. In the past month, there have been two raids on plantations north of here by the terrorists. And someone in this district's been decorating the houses of the whites with dead hawks. What about the governor? I'd say this for him. He leans over backwards, to be fair. We have a curfew, but no martial law. He supports the vote for Africans, but he knows the danger of moving too fast. Won't let either the Africans or the Gregories take the law into their own hands. But while he thinks Obama needs watching, well, so far, at least better give him all the rope he wants. You know the man with him? Pastor Mogul? Oh, no. Not well, it isn't. I first met him at a conference in Switzerland. One of the finest minds in Africa. Oh. I realize that my congratulations on your election come a little late. I called at your home yesterday. I'm sorry I wasn't there. I've been wanting to hear your explanation of my brother's dismissal from the mission school. It may be that the principal acted hastily. But you know as well as I that the boy has been using the school as a center for political agitation. I hope I'm not intruding. Well, of course not. Obama, allow me to present Bruce Craig. Good evening. I've been looking forward to this, sir. 
I believe I am truth. Hold on. Mr. Craig has come from America at the invitation of the African church. You will look far to find a more sympathetic listener. Perhaps then you'll enjoy hearing my explanation of why my brother was expelled from the school of your church. Oh, I hadn't heard of this, Matthew. It happened shortly before you came. My brother Kander is associated with Africa's independence movement. He's not what the church considers politically agreeable. Accordingly, he was expelled from its school for the same reason I was asked to leave the church. Well, I've been wanting to hear your side of the story. The truth has but one face, Mr. Craig. I happen to believe that. But I also believe that one must look behind the face of truth to find the truth itself. Fear can make men act thoughtlessly and foolishly. I've been afraid. Doubtless you too have been afraid. I can assure you churches often have been afraid. A church that would claim my loyalty must not itself be claimed by fear. With that too, I can agree. This will be news to you, Matthew. When Mrs. Craig and I stepped out of the house this evening, we were greeted by a freshly killed hawk. Now, the truth there, of course, is that I'm a white man. But I'm more concerned about what lies behind the face of that truth. I give you my word, Mr. Craig. I had nothing to do with this unfortunate occurrence. I hope you believe me. I do, and I didn't mean to imply that you were associated with the incident. My opinion of you, sir, is based solely upon the esteem in which Pastor Amugo holds you. I am sorry to interrupt, but I'm afraid His Excellency would like to see my husband. Mr. Craig, my wife. How do you do? Pleasure. Welcome to Africa. I'm looking forward to meeting Madame Craig. She'll be happy to know that. Uh -huh. Obama? Excuse us. I believe I owe you an apology. I doubt that, Matthew. Can we talk out there? I should have told you about Oban's brother. It does not help matters any that Oban himself was asked to leave the church. Are the communists really supporting his union? They support any cause that will serve their purpose. Obam has denied personal connections, but still they, they campaigned for him. It was solely on that basis that the elders of our church asked him to leave. But you're not happy about it, are you? No. We were wrong in dismissing him. As long as he was in the fellowship, there was a chance the church could influence him. What do they mean, Matthew? I do not know. It has been happening more frequently. About the dead hawk, this is not the first time. The terrorists seem to be using it as a, a kind of warning. But so far, there has been no violence around here. But the word for hawk is Obam. Yes, it is the official emblem of his party. The terrorists are a radical element within the party, and they want to make it appear that Obama is in sympathy with them. Now that you've seen the inside of Government House, you'll be able to plan the changes you will so surely want to make. I'm certain, Madame Gregory, that no one can grace an occasion such as this more beautifully than does the Governor's lady. Tomorrow's meeting of the Legislative Council will begin promptly, gentlemen. The agenda's unusually full. I've only got one proposal to make myself, Your Excellency. Mobilization of the colony's manpower, I imagine. Yes, sir. It's already on the agenda, but I doubt that we'll get around to it. Well, gentlemen. Obama, Inspector Hall tells me you're planning one of your public meetings for the day after tomorrow. That is so, Your Excellency. Some of your meetings have got out of hand. The police are afraid of an outbreak. All I have to say, Your Excellency, I shall say before the council tomorrow. I assume I have the privilege of the floor. Obama, you know perfectly well I don't question the right of free speech. But the last thing I want to see in this colony is martial law. 
some are already demanding it. And I don't want to have any hotheads taking the law into their own hands. Am I to infer, then, that I shall not be granted the floor tomorrow? You are to infer nothing of the kind. I'm sorry I can no longer talk frankly, but as you wish. Tomorrow, then, 10 o'clock. Obama's election to the council is quite an achievement, Rene. I know he's a university graduate, but still, it's, it's quite a triumph for an African. Don't you agree? I must remind you, Mr. Gregory, that I am African, too. Are you? I'm aware of the notion that African blood is thicker than French, but, well, I've never put much stock in it. Certainly not in your case. You're making it rather difficult. I don't see why. Personally, frankness could make a lot of things easier. Yes, ma'am? Thank you for the pleasant interlude, Rene. Obama, we were talking about your election. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say tomorrow. You'll hear it, Mr. Gregory. And you'll hear it from me, not my wife. The Collier place. must face the fact that lawless violence is no longer an academic matter. Last night's raid on the Collier estate ended in brutal murder. Coming on top of two recent acts of terrorism in the North, it compels us to frame a program of immediate action. Your Excellency. Mr. Gregory. You asked for a program of action. Now, if I knew the men responsible for these outbreaks, I'd name them. In that case, our line of action would be perfectly clear. I suggest Your Excellency ask Obam to tell us who they are. I must answer you directly, Mr. Gregory. I do not know. You make that statement in spite of the fact your brother Kanda is identified as radical elements of the progressive movement? I do, Your Excellency. I'm not responsible for the actions of anyone but myself, political or otherwise. What about the actions of your labor unions? Are none of them political? Or do you no longer represent them? I represent them, Mr. Gregory, but I do not compel them. <laughs> your Excellency, may I have the floor? You may, sir. Gentlemen, believe me, I do not know the men responsible for these acts of violence. My own effort thus far on behalf of the workers has been a call for political action and not for force. Thus far? When will you turn to force? Let your labor unions renounce the hawk and you'll be more convincing. Mr. Gregory, you are new on this council, but I hardly thought you'd need tutoring in parliamentary conduct. Your Excellency, let the colonial government grant but three things and the teeth will be pulled from the jaws of terrorism. First, broaden the franchise. Second, place this entire legislative council on an elective basis. Third, abolish the curfew, except in localities where flagrant lawlessness has occurred. You ask for a program of action, here it is. Adopt it, not as a concession, but as a step toward the self-government which will come, which must come to my people. Adopt it, and you will be unable to number your friends, for they will be legion. Reject it, and your government will face a general strike that will paralyze this country. Your Excellency, I resent these, these strong-arm tactics. And I speak for the majority of this council. And every decent, civilized member of the colony, when Mr. I say... Mr. Gregory, that... you are out of order. This council will not be used as a sounding board for partisan interests. And that applies equally to every member. Obama, I was not born in Africa. 
But I've been close to her for over 30 years, longer than the length of your life. And I believe I love Africa as much as you do. Let me remind you as you nurse your grievances that we have education, health, and a standard of living that were unknown in this part of the world before we came. You talk of freedom and justice. We have given you civilized methods of justice. And the freedom your people have today is a far cry from their old bondage to tribal superstitions. Until the present emergency, they were free to go and come as they please. Your Excellency, it is not that my people want merely to be treated freely or to move freely. My people want to be free. The history of their captivity, whatever its incidental benefits, burns deep. Only name a date for freedom. Give us a timetable for independence. Set a date, any date at all. And we will work together toward the day when this country shall again be free. Oh, good morning, Sundalau. Good morning, Mrs. Craig. It hasn't taken you long to get into the harness. No. The harness feels good after being out of it so long. Miss Craig, your new assistant is here. Oh, fine, Doctor. Thank you. Sundalau, how's the work going? Slowly. The results aren't as tangible as this. Don't expect miracles. Not all at once. Just don't depend on them, and they'll come to pass. There we are now. That's all finished. I gave your assistant her uniform. When she relieves you, I could use your help. We'll have to operate. Yes, Doctor. Good morning. Good morning. We haven't met, but I want to say that I wish your husband well in his new position. Thank you. I'm sorry. This is Sundar Lal from the church in India. He's come at the request of the African church to work with us. Not here at the hospital, I'm sorry to say. I wouldn't be of much use here. I work at the mine, which accounts for the way I'm dressed. I had hoped to see Mr. Craig. He wasn't at the house. He's visiting one or two of the schools. And that usually means he's away for the day. Can it wait? It may be important. Well, I think we can get word to him. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, Martha. Rennie, this is Martha Okubu. She'll handle the tricky cases. I shall do the best I can. If you want anything, just call on Martha. Thank you. Kedu. What do you mean, Nain Yoyun Sobu? Asum, Asum. Gipu Afei. Kankile? Abiago, Kriko. wealth. And what have they given you in return? Do you have more land? Those of you who once plowed your own fields now work the land of the white planter. For what? For a white man's salary? Do you have more wealth? Those of you who work in a white man's mind, what is your wealth? Is it the few coins you receive at the end of a week's hard labor? Is this your wealth? If you are African, 
listen to me. If this is your country, listen to me. If this is your land, listen to me. Yesterday, I sat on the white man's council. Yesterday, I asked for three small words. I asked that men be allowed to vote who have no land. I ask that you be allowed to elect the men who govern you. I ask that the curfew be ended so that we may walk in this land of ours at night as free men walk. If these requests had been granted, there would be no need for a general strike. He did not grant those requests. To every one of them, he said no. To you, he said no. No, no! What then shall we think of the white man? Shall we believe that he wants us to have our land? No! 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 no, no, no. Shall we believe when he promises wealth? No! no, no. Shall we believe that he intends to set us free? No! Wait, my friend, wait! You must listen to me. There's another side to this. May I speak to them? Naduna Joe! Naduna Joe! Listen to me, my people. Much of what Obama has told you is true. Some of the white men have taken our land, but others have built our schools. Some have stolen our country's wealth. But others have helped us fight the Tsetse fly. They have given us hospitals and healed our bodies. It's true that some would deny freedom to us. But others have given us the word of God that we may be freed from the jungle swamps of fear and sin. Owen has spoken truth, but it is half-truth. Be careful, my people, lest for half-truth you give yourselves to violence, as some have already done. For those who achieve in violence are fit only for rule by force. Obam, we must not become the kind of men we condemn. How do we justify ourselves if hated because we are not white? We return that hatred simply because others are not black. We are working for a better tomorrow than that. Adieu. Today, some of our children, many of them, are being trained for that tomorrow. And they are being trained in schools that were founded by white men and are maintained largely by white men. Hello. Where did you get your dreams? Where did you learn to hope? Come with me. I must go to town. Good. It's on your way. Kiddo. Kiddo. You have a strong, clear voice. Now I want you to listen to some voices to which you have closed your ears. Mother! Mother, this is Obam, my friend. Mother? It is easy to be impatient, but remember this. When the first missionary came to this part of Africa, my mother was already a young girl. Is it not so, mother? When the white missionary came, you were standing tall? Look at this picture. What do you see? A cross. What else? Hands are holding it. They are lifting it up. Brown, black, yellow, white, the hands of all men. This is a fantasy. It is reality, my son. This thing is happening on every continent, and you do not know it. You have been as one who sleeps. 
Not all of us have kept pace with the changes about us. That is our tragedy. It's not that we lack vision, but that our vision outstrips our daring. Always we drag one foot in the past. You speak for the old way of violence and hate, and you think you talk of revolution. Well, I tell you that a greater and more profound revolution has already taken place. In spite of the faltering of his church, Christ has taught our people that they are equal with others before God. Whether the world likes it or not, people are on the march here in Africa and all across Asia, and they will not be stopped. But the direction they take will be determined by men who lead. I pray that they be men of God. And where are such men to be found? In such places as this, my son. Obam, the church to which I give my loyalty is not this small group of men who have turned their backs on you and your brother. I should not still be serving the church if I had deserted because of short-sighted men in her midst. My church is a great company of 700 million Christians across the earth. The living church, of which you and I are a living part. Shall we, whose measure is the measure of man and not of the beast, return to the law of the beast? Our times call for men of noble vision and the courage to make the dream come true. Stay well. Naba. No, no. Never, never. Gregory, what's this I hear about you chaps taking the law into your own hands? Well, Inspector, a few of us out here with our lives and investments at stake decided to protect them. You boys always arrive a bit too late. You can tell your friends the first one to try anything will be shipped home on the next boat. Hmm. You mean if you have anything to say about it, which you don't. Look what happened to Jim Collier. Police cars roaring through the hills, sirens wide open. A big show. The trouble was, Inspector. Jim's throat was already slit. We've got a constitution in this colony, and we're going to see you abide by it. Keep that in mind. Save your heroics. And your skins. Zundalao! <laughs> Thank you. What is it? Barbara sent me the message. Can you get in touch with Obama? Why? I'm afraid there's going to be more trouble. At my place? I don't think so. What do you want me to do? The talk involves Obama, and I'm afraid for him. They are certain he's gone over to the terrorists. I'll have a talk with Obama. When are they planning to do this, Sunderland? This weekend, perhaps tomorrow night. Arima. Kanda, listen to me. You are far beyond all this. In my country, there are 10 million Christians who share a faith that is greater than this faith. 
and a stronger bond than race or country. You will see. For sure, no. I'm a very marvel. This pattern of superstition and fear belongs to Africa's past. What are you creating for her future? If you ever need help, let me know. I mean it. No matter what the circumstances, please call on me. I want to be your friend. Try me. Try me. What's the story, Fred? Ben here got it from one of his boys. My foreman lives near Obama's brother, so he gets them listening around. It was the terrorists, all right. Young Candace has been bragging they're going to pull up another raid this weekend. Any idea where? No, but it's sure to be away from town. They aren't taking any chances. What's this all about? We're heading for more trouble. Will the police know about it? We'll keep the police out of this. Better check the servants. I did. There's no one around. I think there's a chance you can learn anything more by tomorrow. Just a chance. We'll see what you can do. Fred, get word to some of the others. The rest of you, round up guns, ammunition, and stand by. Taking a lot for granted, aren't you, Steve? I'm through taking things for granted. Jim Collier took them for granted, and the other day he got his. And they hung another hawk last night on Ben's place. I go along with Steve. We gotta do what we can. Look, this is a job for the police. Steve, suppose they do pull another raid. What good will personal revenge do except pile vengeance on vengeance and give the poor devils cause for new revenge? You can't break a cycle of injustice that way. College boy. I think you're afraid. Well, maybe we all are. I'm scared and I admit it. What in the name of heaven have we ever done that we should expect them to lick our boots? God knows we've got good reason to be scared. But God also knows that your answer is no answer at all. It's a retreat into the Dark Ages. Finished. You can go back to your books. Right, you men, get going. Listen! Did you speak at the mine? I spoke. You are most alone, my darling, when you're troubled. Let me share your loneliness. Go back to your book, Renee. There are happier thoughts there than those I have to share with you. Then I have been reading the wrong book. Diagnosis and Treatment of the Tropical Diseases of the Eye. I have been reading about the granulation of the eyelid, characteristic of trachoma. What's that got to do with you? I have volunteered my services at the clinic. There's much I have forgotten. The white man's hospital. The patients were African, so was the doctor. I must do something, old bum. I'm good for very little. How long must we wait? They will do nothing at any cost to themselves. And they intend to give us nothing unless we force it from them. You cannot be sure there's strength to force them. They are more afraid of a single raid than all the talk of a strike. If we could only organize our strength, who knows what friends will come and stand with us. Oh, you're talking more and more like your brother. My brother may be close to the truth, Renee. A great man has said, there is one thing mightier than all the forces of Earth, an idea whose time has come, and the time for Africa's freedom has long since come. Must we endure another century of humiliation? Is there no voice to cry this shame before the throne of heaven? Is there no voice at all? Look, 
superstition or juju is necessary. It is foolishness. You're more convincing at the mine. You are beginning to sound like an African again. An African, yes, but not a bush African. And you've attended too many schools and sat at too many conference tables. The foreigners are stupid. They taught me just enough to know that they're my enemy. But they couldn't make me forget Africa. Do you know that you need an army? An army to drive them out? Not the mumbo jumbo of a witch doctor? You'll have an army in time, but you won't have a good one without juju. Everything else has failed you. Revive on our people their ancient faith. Give them back their tribal religions and nothing will stop them. All we're waiting for is a leader. Come with us tonight and our country can be reborn. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll join you later. Don't disappoint us again, my brother. Who is it, Bikwi? On your noka. I'm glad you're here. If Pastor Mugu sent you, you're wasting your time. Now, that was my own idea. Why'd you come to Africa, Mr. Craig? They didn't want you in China, and you're not welcome here. Oh, Bob, the word's around. There'll be violence tonight. What's violence got to do with me? Well, that's exactly the question I came here to ask you. Very well. I once put my faith in reason and calm deliberation. My country's not free. I put my trust in the peaceful sanction of the boycott and the strike and freedoms as far away as ever. I put my faith in the church, and the church has failed to support my people's claim to freedom. There's little choice left, Mr. Craig. I see. You see. You see only what you're conditioned to see. You see with the eyes of a foreigner. I see only with the eyes of an African. And we can never have the same vision. I wonder. Men like ourselves have shared the same vision, are sharing it, in fact, in many corners of the earth. And it's a vision that knows no color or race. I believe you had it once. You ask me why I'm here. Well, this is part of it. I don't want to see repeated the same mistakes we made in China. You have nothing to offer me. I think I have, because you've walked straight out of my path. You remind me of my son. And what I learned from him, that much I have to offer you. My son's name was Ming Dao. And when I first saw my son, he was already 10 years old. My associate in the church on the mission compound found him. He was dying in an epidemic that had already killed hundreds of Chinese, including the boy's parents. His mother and father had been members of our little congregation. So when the boy came under our roof, we decided to take care of him. We had no children, and in a few weeks, we adopted him. Ming Dao accepted me readily as a father, and I loved him as my own son. Ming Dao grew up in the mission church, but it was never really his church. Dr. Lin knew what was happening long before I did. I was a foreigner representing an American church, and I was number one man. Three years later, great political changes were taking place in China. More of the leaflets. What does this mean, Father? The new day has come. China for the Chinese. The foreigners must go home. My father, you're a foreigner, aren't you? Let me see it, son. In the weeks that followed, the people were torn between their old loyalties and the bright promises of the new prophets. Woman, tell the ocean, some year, punong kwa tai. Josha, kun chang dang, lila de hua. Josha, tamen. I felt the greatest danger was that when the communists came, and it was certain they would come, the Chinese Christians would be cut off from their brothers abroad. They came before we expected them. 
They came noisily, but their coming was orderly. Changes were made gradually first, then the new regime took over with a vengeance. And you were thrown out of China? No, we could stay if we so chose. I chose to stay. I could no longer work at the mission, but I was allowed to teach at the government college. There were restrictions, but for three years I saw this people's government at close quarters. I didn't realize how much closer those quarters were to be. Our first inkling of the new turn in events came when my position was canceled. I was ordered back to the mission and confined to the compound. We sent Ming Dao to live with friends until we could be sure of where we stood with the government. It was the last I was to see of him for some time. Mr. Craig, you are under arrest. You won't need those. Quiet! Stay where you are! Bruce. You, Mrs. Craig, remain silent. Let I tell you. Is Mrs. Craig under arrest, too? Certainly. Try not to worry, Barbara. I'll be in touch with you. If you just let me get properly dressed. That'll be taken care of. Then I'll go. John, when we've gone, please get word to Ming Dao. That'll be quite impossible. Let us go up. Oh, Chow Chow, you will out there, you? I told you. There's enough light in here for a good picture. We do not need your advice. Quick down! After a year or so, the affair became less like a comic opera and more like a bad dream. A dream you can't awake from. I was completely cut off from the outside. I didn't know at the time that others were undergoing similar treatment, a daily minimum of exercise and food whatever sleep one could manage under the circumstances. There were endless nights of questionings. My first examination lasted for 40 nights. And some nights I was questioned two or three times for hours at a stretch. Listen carefully, please. You will write everything you remember about your colleague, Dr. John Maitland. Every conversation you have had, everything you knew or heard others say about him. In particular, recall the details of his proposal for a two-way radio and your subsequent contacts with the American consulate in Hong Kong and your activities in that connection for the FBI. The FBI? How many times must I repeat, sir, I came to China solely in behalf of my church? Mr. Craig, we feel you're being ex exceptionally cooperative. But now you're suffering from fatigue. We shall provide you with a transcript of Dr. Maitland's testimony. Study it and prepare your statement. When you have rested, we shall talk again. Shall we say in approximately three hours? Were you released after that examination? No, apparently I hadn't given them what they wanted. Some weeks later, there was another examination. That one lasted for 35 days. I have misjudged you. That's a heavy price to pay for your faith. No price is too great. I still had no word from the outside from Mrs. Craig or Ming Dao. It was many months later that I learned something of what had happened. I hadn't been seriously ill, but I was mentally confused. At times, I was unable to distinguish between reality and fantasy. My dreams blended with my waking hours so that it was often difficult to tell the one from the other. I tried to discipline my mind by recalling the faces of my questioners and the soldiers in the room. A new face was a new experience and helped stimulate my senses. There was a new one that day. It was my son, 
Ming Dao. The change in him was incredible. There was something more than just the years of our separation. I tried to convince myself that this was part of the fantasy. But that night, I knew it was real. My son. You became my father. That perhaps is my trouble. I've been unable to forget. I was told you had fled and deserted me. Yes, they would have to tell you that. Did you want to forget? I must rid my mind of any thought which weakens my devotion to duty. Yes. I can bear but one supreme allegiance. To God. To my country. You must confess. The judges are impatient. Will you confess? No. Why? Why will you not confess? Because, my son, the charges are not the truth. What do the details matter? Of course they're not all true. Even in this matter, the wireless, I know the testimony is false. But there is truth in some of the charges. Ming Dao, if they promise to set me free tomorrow, I shall tell the truth. And if they promise to kill me tomorrow, I'll still tell the truth. You cannot deny that you've always been an agent for American imperialism and white superiority. Of course I deny that. I've tried to be a Christian. I failed often, but I failed because I was human, not because I was an agent for any imperialism. You believe that? You do not know that you've never prayed a prayer or preached a sermon or greeted a Chinese friend except from a mountain of implied superiority. Always you and your white brothers have come to China to speak of a God and Savior whose face was white. Ming Dao, God knows no color, neither does his church. What's happened, my son? Who's taught you this? Together with the people of our village, you built a church in whom was eagle title vested. Funds were received and collections taken. Who administered the money? Appointments were made to places of authority in the church. Who made them? You called in a Chinese home. Who occupied the seat of honor and why? Because you were a finer, better man than the Chinese guest who was also there? No, because you have a white face, the gift of a white god. My son, I failed you. But remember, Christ has not failed you. I came tonight to help you. I'm here against orders, but I thought I could save you by persuading you to confess. Always I've lost the people I've loved. My parents, you, Missy Barbara. I... Son, you've lost none of us, and you've not lost Christ. I love my country. But I cannot help her. Much of what I've done in these past few years is in deep conflict with what I believe as a Christian. I can no longer put faith in the bright promises of the people's government. I've seen too much violence, too much oppression, too much bloodshed. It's rarely easy to bear witness to the truth. For you, Ming Dao, it will be hard. You're not alone, my son. Whatever comes, you're never alone. Ming Dao, we are more than conquerors. Through him that loved us. Through him that loved us. It's been five years since my release. And I've tried to keep paramount in my life the lesson I learned from my son. It's this. The greatest gift one man can give another is Christ. 
But the giving is not enough. The Chinese Christian, the African church, must know that Christ is theirs. The gift is their very own to hold and to give again. Because I didn't understand, I failed my son. By God's grace, I'll not fail you. More than conquerors. Thank God you didn't let go. Renee, I'm no longer alone. afraid for him. Something is terribly wrong. Where will it happen, Renee? If you know, tell me. I'll do what I can. They've gone to the Blaisdell plantation. It is too late. <laughs> Mr. Gregory, you must let us get out of here before it's too late. Mrs. Carter, you must get upstairs and keep quiet. Over, oh, get them up there and fix the All right, come on. All go back to the room. You'll be quite safe. Over. I told them you'd come. You fools. Do you know what you're doing? Get out of here before it's too late. What are you talking about? Tanner, take me to your leader. He must stop them. Don't listen to him. Tanner. This man is not our friend. He has betrayed us. He's no longer my brother, old Bob. Stand out! Wait! Here's a step for you, Ben. Oh, thanks, Mr. Jeff. You load from him. Right. Now, remember, the second I throw the switch and the floodlights go on, let them have it. George, get upstairs. Cover the balcony. Right, Steve. Look, Steve. The women are terribly frightened. You should have sent them into town. So the wogs can call it off and come back some other night when we're not so lucky to know about it? How about the servants? They've all run away. I think you're dead wrong, Steve. What would you do about it? Maybe 50. A hundred bloodthirsty Africans out there, ready to sack this place. Exactly what would you do? You should have notified the police. There may still be time. Any other suggestions, Overhold? Preacher, get away from that door. Operator, give me the police. Steve, you won't solve anything by taking the law into your own hands. You're deliberately beating the Africans. This is a vicious trap.
Andre. Oh. Through him, beloved. Through him that loved us. Double the guard on him. the hospital with the others and then head back for the compound. Right. Well, that's taught the devils a lesson they won't forget. Just a little bit too late again, now, Inspector. Go away, Gregory. You've done enough damage for one night. I don't think I like that remark, Inspector. No. I don't suppose you do. How do you like that? I want all of you men at headquarters tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Why don't you learn to use one of these things? I'm going to say easy, boy, easy. Mm -hmm. My people, our church invited Bruce Craig to come to Africa to join hands with us and to share with us his rich experience in another land. Now we have killed him. Yes, we have taken his life. Our impatience, our hatred, and our blind, unreasoning prejudice have killed him. Is the cause for which he lived also dead? Because some of us were impatient. We are today farther from freedom than ever. Because certain lawless men 
permitted prejudice to blind them. This country stands on the brink of riot and unrest. Our country cannot be made free by hatred and bloodshed. We shall only become slaves to hatred, our own and the hatred of others. We know we must have freedom. And when we take this great desire of ours to Jesus, and we ask him, is this desire good? We hear him answer, yes, my children, it is good. One day freedom may come to this land, but it will not come easily. Our malice and our sin have already cost us dearly. Jesus Christ, in his own sacrifice, has shown us the way. And we must learn to follow in that way before we can call ourselves truly free. The charges are not true, Rene, but whether they find me guilty or not, I know that you will always believe me. And remember, my darling, I am no longer alone. All my love always, Obama. remind the prosecutor that this is not a trial. We are here to determine whether there is any just cause in bringing a formal charge against the accused. That is our sole purpose, and the court cannot permit any action designed to prejudice the case of the defendant. 
The prosecutor will accordingly refrain from further leading of the witness. He may proceed with his questioning. Now, Inspector, permit me to summarize your testimony. The court will correct me if I'm in error. You arrived at the house on the Blaisdell Plantation shortly after 10 o'clock last Friday evening, accompanied by a number of the police. At the time of your arrival, there was intensive firing which originated from several parts of the house and was directed toward a large number of armed African men. These men were trespassing, apparently trespassing, on the Blaisdell property with many of them endeavoring to escape. Further, you have testified that, that two of the police apprehended the defendant at the scene and you ordered him taken in custody. Now, Inspector, in the light of the facts to which you have testified, can you tell the court whether the defendant was a party to the act of violence as charged? No, I cannot. No further questions. Okay. If it please the court, I wish to call one more witness. A witness whose testimony will be conclusive. I call the brother of the defendant. I swear by almighty God that the evidence I shall give to the court shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. What is your name? Kanda, son of Eva. Do you know this man? Yes. Tell the court the relationship between you and the defendant. He was my brother. Is he not still your brother? Yes. Yes. Now tell the court where you were last Friday evening at 10 o'clock. I was with my friends. And how were you and your friends dressed? In ordinary clothes. Do you recognize this emblem? Yes. Tell the court what the emblem represents. A hawk. What is your brother's name? Obama. Were you and your friends on the evening we are talking about wearing emblems similar to this? We were all wearing them. Tell the court where you and your friends were last Friday evening at approximately 10 o'clock. The name of the place. We were on the place of estate. And what was your intent and that of your friends? We... Tell the court the truth. We planned to kill the white residents and burn the building. Now. Is it true that prior to that evening, you had stated publicly that your brother was capable of organizing the workers of this district into an army? Answer yes or no. Yes. And is it also true that you had declared your brother was at the head of a nationalist movement committed to violence? I believe that. Yes. Now, think carefully before you answer. Was your brother, who is called the Hawk, the man who not only planned the raid on the Blaisdell estate, but was himself the leader of the men. No. My brother had nothing to do with it. I was mistaken. He has never been one of us. He came to the Blaisdell estate because he is my brother. If it please the court. You may speak, but I must warn you that whatever you say may be given in evidence upon your trial. Your Honor. Kanda is indeed my brother. 
And I know now that Bruce Craig was my brother, too. Had I learned this earlier, Bruce Craig would be alive today. I cannot judge this boy and his companions. But just as Candor is guilty under the law, before God, I too am guilty. As guilty as he. I'm guilty, Your Honor. Not so much because I was tempted to violence, but because I had already yielded to hatred. I was impatient and proud, shouting when I should have reasoned, making threats when I should have sought understanding. I wanted freedom for my people. I gave them only the desire to destroy. I have failed my brother. By being less than a man, I would like him to be. But there are others I have failed. A company of Christians in whose fellowship I once found a place. Matthew Amugu belongs to that company. So does Thunder Lau and Inspector Hall and Mrs. Bruce Craig and countless numbers whom I will never meet or know. God grant that I will work with them toward our country's freedom and love and understanding. It is possible for a man to walk as a stranger in this land, alone. And the African will ask of such a man, where then are your brothers? They will not ask this of me again. For I am no longer alone.